Are you a leader in customer success, pre-sales, professional services, support? Do you work behind the scenes and roll up your sleeves to make sure that customers are happy? Renew. Then this is for you. Welcome to the GSD Podcast. Welcome to the GSD Podcast. Getting it done. Services, success, and software. We'll talk with the pros that have been in the trenches, getting service teams off the ground, launching new types of groups to service customers, or running agencies that don't have a product attached to it. For the pros, by the pros. This is the GSD Podcast, and this is your host, Jeff Kushmerick. Hey there, it's Jeff. Uh, thanks again for, for tuning in. I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the next episode, a little bit a uh, different type of episode, but I thought it would be extremely valuable. Just as a side note, I got into a, a little bit at the intro, but uh, with uh, Michael Zapersky from Consulting Success, a lot of people have asked me recently, probably once or once, at least once or twice a month um, uh, over the last year or so, hey, how did you go out? What did you do? X, Y, and Z. And I usually point them to Michael's stuff. Um, I asked him to be on the podcast and he, and he graciously uh, said yes. And uh, Michael is great. He gets into the ABCs of everything. I, I, I ask some in-depth questions, but he has so much material out there and he, he lets, gives it all away for free as we get into a little bit. Um, but anyways, uh, hope you really enjoy it. Uh, Michael's awesome. Feel free to ask me any questions on this stuff as well, too. And you can send me a LinkedIn message. If not, uh, send me an email off the website. But uh, I really enjoyed the conversation. Michael's also a podcast pro, so uh, he sounds great, answers questions great and everything. So I really hope you guys enjoy this episode and uh, see you all on the next one. All right, we are live. Uh, I'm joined by Michael Zapersky. So Michael, thanks again. It's super pleasure to uh, have you on the show, first of all, because I'm a huge listener of the podcast. So for you to say, you know, yeah, I'll, I'll jump on yours uh, it just means a lot to me. So thanks a lot. And my pleasure, Jeff. Thank you for, uh, for having me. Yeah. So one of the reasons why I was super excited to get you on is that um, I think, you know, we've, we've talked about this a little bit in the past. I had been doing some side stuff um, for a little bit and then went out on my own um, right in the middle of COVID uh, or at the beginning of it all. And uh, what I started hearing from my network or doing podcasts with my network too was after we'd stop recording, they're like, hey, how did, how did you do all this, right? And so I'm like, oh, just go subscribe to this guy over here and read his books and everything. Um, but, it, you know, I, I do have a lot of listeners that I don't necessarily have that one-on-one -on -one, uh, communication with. Uh, but I definitely get these types of questions and I just thought it would be great to have a podcast, uh, which is a little different, you know, just to reframe the conversation. I'm a professional services consultant for SaaS B2B people. And, uh, and I have people that are just in the industry and like still doing it, right? We don't go through the autobiographical stuff as much as like, how do you do X, Y, and Z? And it's shop talk for professional services and SaaS people, customer success stuff. Um, so, you know, a lot of my peers were starting to get to that point where we're like, hey, this would be a good thing to do. So I have some questions about that. But first, I just wanted to give you a chance uh, to, to, you know, tell everybody like when you made that move, uh, when you were looking, you know, I was looking through your, your LinkedIn profile and the jobs that you had, and I've heard your stories and your, uh, your Japan trip and things like that, mm -hmm. where you just said, you know what, I see something here, I'm going to go for it. And I'd love to hear about that moment. Yeah, well, I mean, for for me, this all started when I was um, really transitioning from high school into college, uh, and my cousin Sam and I, who's my business partner at Consulting Success, uh, to this day, uh, we we started a business together, and it was a web design and development business. Um, he did more of the, or you know, did all the design and development, and and my, I was really client management, communications, marketing, strategy, 
Um, and I was applying at that time what I was learning from reading a lot of books on the topic of business and marketing and strategy. Uh, and so that was really how I got started in, in consulting. Uh, and that business was a great experience. Uh, we started another consulting business after that um, and several more after that as well. And you know, just to, to kind of fast forward on, on the story, what happened was is uh, through having you know, quite a bit of success running consulting businesses, both Sam and I thought one day when we were at a family barbecue one summer uh, and we were working at, on different businesses at that time, we said, you know, let's do something together uh, again, but this time let's do it online. And this was kind of the early-ish days still. I mean, you know, there's a lot of business happening online, but uh, it was still relatively early. So about 13 years or so ago, let's say. Yep. Um, and we decided to launch Consulting Success. And the idea behind it was simply because we didn't have a monetization plan at that point. We thought, let's just figure out how we can share our experience of building consulting businesses. And let's be very open and transparent about what uh, we found had worked, what we found didn't work. Uh, and so we shared, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly of running consulting businesses and really kind of stories from the trenches. And so for the first, you know, year uh, or two, we were just putting out a lot of content um, with our experiences and people were reaching out and kind of built a community around that saying, hey guys, like this is great content. Do you have a course that can show us how to become successful consultants? And we said, no, but we'll, we'll create one. And so we did. Uh, and you know had a, some good success with that, and then many of those uh, clients who were seeing success said, "This is really great. Uh, you know, I feel clear. I'm making progress. I'm generating more income. Blah blah blah. Um, do you have coaching? Like, can I can I work more personally, more closely with you guys?" And we said, "No, we don't have that kind of program, but we'll create one." Mm -hmm. And so, fast forward to this day, you know, we've had now several thousand uh, consultants and people go through our training programs to become a successful consultant that's called momentum. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've had now about 600 uh, some odd consultants who have come through our clarity coaching program where we really work closely with them to help them uh, to grow their consulting businesses in a, in a meaningful way. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and uh, Michael, of course, such a gentleman is not doing that, that huge sell, but I will say Michael's program puts together this sort of like made for you recipe of you have to do the work, but this is the work that you need to do. Is that is that a fair statement to say? Or, yeah. yeah, I mean, our, our momentum program is, is really more for the early stage consultant, the person who uh, might just be, you know, a year or two into the business or someone who's looking to transition from corporate to consulting and just wants a proven roadmap that they can that they can follow. Mm -hmm. uh, and then clear, the Clarity Coaching Program is where we customize a plan and, and really help to develop a strategy. And then there's a lot more accountability and support. Uh, and, and coaching, uh, mm -hmm. but like any program or any investment, you know, that anyone makes, uh, it's, it's always going to be, your success will be uh, tied to how much commitment, dedication and work you put into it. So we certainly do our best to support our clients and uh, we see, you know, very great successes, but at the end of the day, it's always going to be about how much, uh, you know, work and commitment you put into what, what you're, what you're doing. Absolutely. Uh, actually, you had touched on something I wanted to transition into it, which is, um, sort of the scenario where people say, I'm going to go into doing my own thing. And I'm always amazed by just the variety of, we touched on this earlier, like the disparate verticals that you sort of cover, but above the vertical aspect, is it, have you do had any sort of overwhelming trends of when people decide to make that move as in, I got laid off, I'm sick of the corporate thing, I need a lifestyle, I've got kids, like regardless, like I know, I know you know your demographics well, so. Yeah, I mean, the, the, so probably the most common is people saying, I've been thinking about doing this for some time, um, you know, but I just was waiting for the right time. And then the right time typically comes when either there's some big disruption, which might be, you know, let's call it uh, a pandemic or it could be uh, an economic you know, collapse, yep. uh, or could simply be, yeah, company downsizing, they get laid off. Uh, but it can also just be in many cases, when people look at their career, and think to themselves, you know what, I don't really see a path to continue going up. Uh, or I don't really feel like I'm doing my best work. I don't really feel like I'm realizing my potential. Uh, I'm tired of office politics. Like, I mean, there, you know, there's many reasons that can push somebody over the, the line. But most people will say, yeah, it's something that I've been thinking about for, for quite some time, or my friends or colleagues, you know, 
have been telling me that I'd be really good at, at, at doing this. And they just simply get to a point where they recognize that and, and feel that it's time for them to kind of take their, uh, you know, their future and their destiny into their own hands uh, and they make the leap. Absolutely. You know, one of the biggest problems that I had um, was the sort of um, the imposter syndrome aspect of things. And do you find that that's a big thing? And is that something that you help people out with? Or, or is, is I was always like, no, like, why would people come to me? And, you know, they're going to delete all my emails if I send them and things like that. So, yeah, I know. I think, Jeff, you're probably the only person in the world that's ever felt that, um, <laughs> it, you know, I, I don't think that anybody can say that they have that they haven't experienced or felt that at some point in their career or in their lives. And if they say that they haven't, I don't know if they're being 100%, 100% truthful. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's very common. And, uh, you know, I think I believe that imposter syndrome is really a symptom of pushing yourself into new areas, you know, going beyond the zone of the of the known into the unknown frontier. Uh, and it's simply a symptom or a sign that you're challenging yourself. Uh, and you should, you know, at the early stages for a new consultant or a new entrepreneur, uh, that can be, that can feel overwhelming. It can create a lot of uncertainty and fear and discomfort. Uh, but for the more experienced consultant, uh, you learn to, to channel, to harness, mm -hmm. you, to recognize that feeling and, and you embrace it. Uh, and it's why so often at the early stages of, you know, any business venture, uh, you will look at quote unquote failures as, as real failures. And they'll, they'll knock down your self-esteem. They'll make you, you know, doubt whether you should be doing this or, or not. Uh, but as time goes on, those exact same feelings, uh, you recognize them very quickly, but you brush them aside pretty fast because you know that they're just going to come like they're, you know, fleeting in the moment and, yeah. and then they're going to be gone and you keep moving forward. But I, I certainly had many situations where I asked myself, you know, am I, am I cut out to do this? Do I deserve to be doing this? And I remember, you know, early on when I was in Japan, I'd opened up a branch office for our business over there. I was advising organizations like Panasonic and Dow Jones and Financial Times and Sumitomo and Omron and a whole bunch of other like, you know, multi-billion dollar organizations. And I was a 20 something year old kid. Yeah. You know, I was a young guy and I, I was walking into boardrooms with mainly men who were in their in many cases, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s um, at, at boardroom tables. And I felt, you know, a lot of overwhelm and a lot of, not even overwhelm, I think a lot of, uh, you know, could have been fear, uncertainty. I wasn't comfortable. You know, not only was I surrounded by people who were much older than I was, not only, you know, were they at a much bigger company than my company was, but I was in a completely different culture, different language, uh, and I was the outsider. Uh, and so early on, that was, that was certainly, you know, create a lot of uncomfortable situations for me. But as I started to really understand why I was thinking that way and what I've done over the years that I feel has really benefited me, and I hope maybe it benefits your listeners as well, mm -hmm. is anytime that I'm confronted with a challenge, I try to, to think to myself, what's the opposite of that? Like, what is the, what is the advantage? What is the opportunity right. here? And so what I recognized is that, you know, you can always look at a situation and say the grass is always greener. So when, for example, you're younger, you can look at people that are older and say, yeah, they have the advantage. When you're older, you, you typically say, well, yeah, the younger people have the advantage because they understand technology or they're more, you know, more um, full of like vigor and youth and energy. Um, or uh, many people say, oh, I'm in a small town, right? This is pre-COVID. I'm in a small town. Uh, that's why my business isn't doing well. And then someone who's in a, in a big city says, oh, yeah, the reason I'm not doing well is because there's so much competition here, right? So it's always easier to kind of find and to point to the grass as greener. But what I've found to be really beneficial is to look at a situation. So for me in Japan, I first said, yeah, I'm the outsider. I, you know, my, I don't speak Japanese fluently yet. Um, and I was working towards it. Uh, and I'm younger, I'm a smaller company. I was seeing through the negative lenses. Mm -hmm. But instead what I did, and I, as I started to flip it to go, well, what's the positive lens here? What's, how can I see this in a, in a positive light? And what I recognized was the reason I was at the table and the reason why they were valuing and paying for my you know, advice and expertise uh, is even though sometimes I didn't necessarily feel like it was much expertise was because I was giving them a view into English speaking markets. Mm -hmm. I was able to, to take and look at what they, were, what they were doing and presenting and planning and tell them how that would likely play out to an English speaker or to North American and European marketplaces 
And that's something that they didn't have. It didn't matter that they were a multi-billion dollar organization. It didn't matter that they had you know, tens of thousands of, of staff. It didn't matter that they were older or any of those things because they didn't have what I had. And that's why I was in that room. And so when people start to talk about imposter syndrome, I always encourage them to think about and to recognize that you know, all those other things that might be causing you to feel that way, put those to the side and ask yourself, there's probably a reason why you're at the table. There's probably a reason why you're having that conversation. And that's what you should focus on. Absolutely. No, that was great. Thanks for, for getting into that. Um, so uh, if, if people have not seen your work or read the books or listened to the podcast, um, we both sort of subscribe to the same philosophy in terms of our material that we put out, which is, is let's give it away. Like, I'm going to just tell you everything that we know. Um, so one part, I'd like to hear your philosophy on that, but, but that's sort of teeing up to, I'm going to ask you a bunch of series of questions that like, you don't have to pay for the program to get the answers to it's all on your website and everything. But, um, but it, 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 there's a sort of 360 view into that because that's a big thing that I'm sure you preach to your consultants as well too. Like put your knowledge out there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just, you know, look at the data, look at, uh, history and, uh, it, you, the people that you typically recognize as being the most successful, those who are most visible in the marketplace, uh, those who most you know brands and organizations, whether profit or nonprofit, tend to go to, are are those who, for example, have written books, or you know they get up on stages, or they um, you know they make videos. Like they're the people who are publishing and dis, uh, distributing their their ideas their expertise consistently. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a lot in a book, right? You know, you have 300 pages, 200 pages, whatever, however long it might be, um, sometimes much less, it doesn't matter about the, the length, but there's a lot in there. And so if that person is giving away their, their knowledge and so much detail, right? You might think, well, why would, why would somebody need to buy uh, and pay them for their expertise? Well, they're paying you for their expertise because the most valuable and kind of scarcest resource that we all have is time. And so a savvy buyer who, who actually has the ability and the desire to become a client, and I mean, somebody who actually would you know, become a client and a buyer uh, is someone who, who recognizes that they're not, they don't have the time to do everything themselves. They don't have the resources to do it themselves. They don't have the skills to do it themselves. And therefore, when they find somebody who has the expertise that they need, then it only makes sense for them to go to that person. Uh, there will always be people out there who will take your ideas and try and run with them and implement them themselves. But those people typically uh, are the ones who would never be your buyer. They would never actually pay for your advice or they're not ready to buy anytime soon. So there's no harm in them actually consuming and trying to implement what they learn because in many situations, you know, they're going to not be successful and they'll have to come back to you or they might be successful and all the power to them and they'll give credit to that success you know, from you and they'll think to themselves, wow, if I got so much of that information, you know, uh, or so, so much value from that information that was free, imagine what would happen when I actually engaged with that person and paid the money and made an investment, yeah. you know, how much greater success and how much uh, greater level of commitment I would have to taking action because I've actually made an investment into it. Yeah, absolutely. Or, or they could share it out to their network and like, hey, you know, I remember, you know, people get together, they're talking about business problems. And suddenly they're like, oh, did you read this blog post? Or you should check this guy out. He knows what he's talking about or whatever. Yeah. Personally. And then it just kind of goes from there. It's just, if you put it out there, my belief is people will, will see it. They'll recognize you as an authority. Um, and if they, you know, I always write on the end of something like, hey, if this, you know, you need a little help understanding, like give me a call. Maybe I can help you out or something like that. So, so great. So let's, I'm curious. Um, do you find people are more scared about doing the marketing or going out and uh, hitting their network up or actually like launching sales or all three of those are <laughs> 33% each or? No, I mean, I'd say it's, it's everything, right? The yeah. um, most people are experts in their area. They, they know how to do great work and they know, they know how to deliver value. Um, they have in some cases experience promoting the company, uh, you know, products and services of where they've worked in the past. But the difference is when you're building a consulting business, you are the product and the service. And so it's not comfortable for most people to, to talk about themselves and to make themselves look good because society teaches you that you shouldn't do that, right? Society teaches you that you should put the focus. Like you, if you do that, you know, people call you a jerk or like, yo, your ego is big. 
Um, and that's very understandable because if you went into a, you know, into a new party and tried to just talk to people about how good you are and everything that you've done, um, they're going to think that, you know, something's wrong with you. But in your business, you have to toot your own horn because if you don't, nobody else will do it for you. And, you know, I've had so many conversations with clients over the years who, who have so much expertise, so many wonderful accomplishments and achievements, and, you know, they never talk about them. But if you don't talk about them, then how can a potential buyer know about that value that you've created or that experience that you've had? And if they don't know about that, they're less likely to actually engage you. And so it's important that you become comfortable with putting all of your, you know, your brilliance and expertise out into the world. It doesn't mean that you, uh, you know, you start off when you talk to someone and just say everything that you've done, but that's, that's where marketing, that's where especially content comes in is that you can use content. You can use, you know, the written word or videos or audio or whatever the format is, because they can all work, mm -hmm. but you can tell your story and you can shine a spotlight on your expertise through stories, through examples, through, you know, knowledge uh, that very clearly demonstrates your understanding and, and the value that you can deliver so that people very clearly see without you even having to tell them like, wow, this person really understands this area. Look at what they've created here. Look at the depth or the detail or, you know, the understanding that, that they have. Um, I have an issue in this, in this area. I should probably talk to them. Mm -hmm. That's how that, that dynamic works. And certainly people aren't comfortable doing that right away. But if you want to have a thriving business that can withstand, you know, any challenges in any economy and really is going to be successful for you long term, then it, this is one of these skills and mindsets that you definitely want to develop and embrace. Oh, that's awesome. So it's fun. I had one of these conversations yesterday with somebody and uh, and they were like, no, I absolutely will. I, I just need a year. And so I know some people, this conversation will spark that in their mind. So let's go, let's go down that road. So putting some stuff together, some the initial foundational elements, uh, where, where would you suggest people start doing like, hey, I'm going to go and create my Google Doc on how I'm going to get my business going in the next year. What sort of North Star would you point them towards? Well, so the first thing that I would say is there's two typical paths to getting into the consulting business. The first is that you, uh, you kind of nibble at it, right? You, you, you start to build a business on the side, almost like what some people call a side hustle, right? I Meaning that. you I still have, that. what's that? I did the same thing, but people were yeah, asking right? me, like, so, hey, can you just help out over here? I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, and for many people, you know, that's going to be the best path for them because maybe they're in a situation where they don't have a bunch of savings. Uh, and they're, you know, they are the, the sole provider for their family. Uh, and they just, they just either aren't comfortable with a level of risk or they're not able to, they don't, they're not confident and able to just make that leap and go hundred percent into consulting. And so for those people, right, what they're going to want to do is start to look at who in their network can they connect with um, and, uh, you know, and take on some small projects on the side until they get their, their revenue and their confidence to a level where, they feel that they can now make that leap and go, you know, 100% full in. But regardless of whether you do that or you're now, you know, no longer with your previous employer and you've kind of put your shingle out there, um, and you know, and Science said, yeah, I'm I'm open for business as a consultant. The best place to always start is with your existing connections. Uh, we've worked with many clients who have been in that transition period where they're still working at their job, a full-time job but they now want to transition to becoming a consultant. And what we've done in most of those cases is actually help them to look at how their existing client can become, or sorry, their existing employer can become their first client. And there's steps and ways to make that transition. So that would be the first thing. The second thing is to really look at, you know, who is in your network, uh, your colleagues, your past employers, uh, suppliers, vendors, just relationships that you have in the industry. And this is what we call, we have a kind of a whole campaign around, it's called a network reactivation campaign. But the whole idea is to reactivate the relationships that you have. And hopefully you've been building relationships and you've been, you know, creating value and, um, you know, you, you have connections with people, uh, but that's always low hanging fruit is to start there. And for so many consultants, that actually becomes how they get their first clients without having to do a great deal of initial marketing through the right kind of network reactivation. When you say the right things and you have the right message and all that kind of stuff, it's a great way to, to start having conversations with people that can very quickly lead to them saying, Hey, you know, now that you're not no longer working full time, they're like, actually, I'd love to get your help in this area. Uh, and so that's what I typically suggest that people do to begin.
Yeah. And I just want to say, <laughs> we didn't write these scripts out for each other. I followed those exact steps. And just for anybody listening, I have not done any direct marketing emails. Um, it was all, all yeah, I've been out on my own for a year now. Um, and everything is through network reactivation that, that Michael's discussing right now. And just letting people know you're open and available. I remember, I, you know, if you're in a good relationship with your customers um, and you're just starting out and you've got somebody and maybe they're asking you for 40 hours of work or 30, um, to have that conversation with them so you'll know when to start looking for more. And that's one type. And I know, um, you know, Michael preaches about sort of I think maybe we can talk about the, the next stage about having a little bit more of a predictable. You've been out there on your own for a year and and you want to not live project to project. So we should probably talk about that that element, which is like your time. It's the only thing that you have and ways that you find um, people are able to diversify their business in, for more repeatable uh, volume and, and transactional stuff. Yeah, I mean, so the, this is really what I um, call the kind of the marketing maturity model. Uh, mm -hmm. So once you're kind of beyond leveraging and and reactivating or activating your your network and connections, the next step, and this is very important because you know consistently we have people reaching out who have either you know had some success or in some cases had great success for many years, and they've just lived on the on the back of referrals and their network, and it's got them to. Uh, you know, in some cases, even millions of dollars in in, in revenue and, and sales and so forth. But at some point, they, they recognize that they can't continue growing. Um, and maybe it's somebody who's got to 60,000 a year, and they, but they can't get beyond that. Or someone who's at half a million, they can't get beyond that. Like the number doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you'll start to see that your what I call the referral well will start to dry up. And if you're wise, you will be proactive in, in taking steps before that actually happens. But even if you wait too long, the sooner that you start building marketing into your business, uh, the sooner you'll start getting the benefits and results from that. So there's the marketing maturity models essentially kind of dictates or, or states that there's, there's two different big forms of marketing. You have uh, outbound marketing, right, which is doing outreach and you contacting, you reaching out to an ideal client. And then you have inbound where an ideal client comes to you. And the holy grail that every consultant wants is just to to pretty much have a, a business built on inbound where ideal clients reach out to them consistently. Because the fact is no one really enjoys doing outreach. No one really enjoys having to, you know, knock on people's doors and, and, you know, introduce yourself and, and be the one to, to reach out to somebody, everybody to wants just to have, you know, to wake up and have emails coming in and, and phone calls coming in, right. From people who want to, to build your business. The challenge is that to create enough inbound lead flow, it takes time. It's a long-term strategy. And so if you are earlier stage in your business, you're going to need to spend more time and a higher percentage of your time doing outbound and outreach. And when you do that, the reason why it's so important is because uh, one way of doing inbound as an example would be, you know, you write a, a really valuable article, you put it on your website or on LinkedIn, or you do a guest post or, you know, things of, of that nature. But unless you have a website that generates a lot of traffic already, you could put that up on your website and it could take months for you to actually start seeing the benefits of search engine optimization and getting enough people to your, to your website where it really matters. Mm -hmm. um, but with outbound, I, I can literally go onto LinkedIn today or you know, access some kind of a list mm -hmm. and I can find an ideal client and I can send them an email today. Like I, could, I can call them today. I can, I can take action to get in front of my ideal client today. And that's, that's the power of outbound over inbound is that with inbound, number one is you can't, dictator you can't uh control who is going to come to you right with with that uh and so even with with advertising if you start an ad campaign it's going to typically take you know one two three months if not longer to really dial it in to make it work for you whereas with outbound you can make a list of five ten fifty five hundred people who are your true ideal clients and begin reaching out to them today tomorrow next week and so it's much faster so the the concept here is you start off with a higher percentage of your time doing outbound because it can start generating results for you faster. Yeah. So you, and then you have a lower percentage doing the inbound stuff. As time goes on and your lead flow increases and you have a stronger pipeline, you have clients, you're going to be able to switch your percentage of time from doing outbound to doing more inbound. And then as time goes on and your business is really doing you know, well and you have quite, uh, you know, plenty of clients, then you won't really need to do much outbound at all. 
if any, because your inbound will already be, the seeds will be planted. It'll be, you know, bringing you great results over time uh, and it'll just continue. You just can kind of continue to feed that machine. So that's the progression that people can kind of think about. Yeah. No, and that's, it's by I, a couple points on that, because I don't want people to feel overwhelmed. First of all, if, if, and correct me where I'm wrong, <laughs> you're the experts. Um, if you price yourself correctly, um, I, I want, I want people to not feel like, oh my God, I'm, I'm going to be signing up for 60 hours a week to do this. It's, I have found it's the opposite. Um, if I, I've priced my offering fair, but correctly in that I can work 30 hours a week and spend 10 hours back into my business. And that more than covers off sort of the elements that we're talking about. Yeah, there's a little upfront stuff when I was putting the website together. Um, but but there's that aspect. And then there's this other element of creating repeatable processes and, and items that you can that can uh, get you in the door faster or not have it be like, oh my God, I, I only have 40 hours to work. How am I going to do what I need to do? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I mean, you're getting to a really big topic here that we could spend days talking about. Yeah, right, I was trying to pricing figure strategy. out how are we going to get into this. Yeah, but no, I think it's, it's a really, really important topic because very often people underprice um, and undercharge, right? And so they have low fees, which leads to them having to work a lot more hours. And I'm, again, I'm not a big fan of working on an hourly basis um, because you're essentially just trading time for money. And there's a lot of dynamics between the client and the consultant that don't really um, don't work very well. But even given that, yeah, if you're charging too low or too little, uh, you, you end up having to work a lot more. And then when you're working a lot more, you have less time to actually work on your business. And so this is one of the things a lot of consultants run up against, at, you know, inevitably at some point in their business, which is they're too busy delivering and working in the business. They have no time, as Michael Gerber says, right, to, to work on the business. Right. Um, and, and then you're, you're essentially just all you've done is create another job for yourself. Um, and that's, that's an, you know, something that you want to be wary of. Uh, and so being very um, kind of, you know, intentional and conscious of how do you want to price yourself? Uh, you know, what makes sense? What doesn't make sense? And you might give yourself a little bit more wiggle room early on to make some mistakes with that because you don't always know right off the bat unless you're getting some really good, you know, kind of guidance um, and experience around that. But it, it's okay to make some mistakes early on and learn from them. But, but you certainly want to structure uh, your business and your time so that you always have time to work on the business and not only in it. That's right. And if, if people are looking for suggestions, especially since this is a big professional services type thing um, in terms of the people listening to this, uh, there's nothing wrong with having a, a checklist, a, a consulting basically starter agreement where you get in and do some discovery and do the research that you need to do in order to put together some more pricing and some more bounds around uh, what's going on. And, and you can then have this same format that you use over and over again. I'm going to guarantee you that McKinsey and Bain and everybody, they've got their template and they do it, but it's as long as it's successful and you're providing value. I, I felt bad about that originally. I'm like, oh, I'm taking this client's thing and genericizing it and rolling that to the next. And I'm like, but it gets the job of what we need to do because if we're getting paid for our pattern recognition, then we're able to say like, I know usually when I get brought into this situation, I'm gonna take the bias off, but I usually see these types of things and I yeah. dive deep into them and everything. Like yeah. for, for me, people are like, oh, okay, your onboarding and implementations haven't worked well. Uh, are you, you know, do you have project plans? Do you, are you selling, you know, are you telling the customers in pre-sales what they're doing and things like that? And so there are ways that you can productize these elements and you should not feel bad about them. You're being paid to be streamlined and you're getting paid back to what Michael was saying on your experience. And that's what they're bringing you on for. Like you can probably get out of 10 hours of research what it might take somebody else 15 or 20 because you, you've been around and you know what these, you, you know where the bodies are buried usually and stuff like that. So awesome. Well, Michael's shaking his head, so I'm, gonna, I, I'm glad we're in agreement on that one. Um, so let's see, we, we're about ha you know a, a couple more minutes into this. A couple quick rapid fire questions: um, individual versus company, as in I'm a solo person versus like oh no, I'm gonna get five, ten people in the accounting and X, Y, and Z. Where do you usually caution people in those sort of areas? Uh, I don't caution them. I okay. I would suggest to people spend some time thinking about what's meaningful for them. You know, what does success look like? There's, um, you know, there's three and a half business models that typically work really well for consultants. 
It's good for you to know which one is the right one for you. Uh, you can decide to be a solo independent consultant uh, for the life of your business and do extremely well, be very profitable, have a great lifestyle. Um, but the opposite is also true. You could be a solo independent consultant feeling overworked and that you just have a job and you know no time to enjoy life. Um, and the same thing is true for having a firm you know, where you have a bunch of people, uh, you structure that appropriately. If you enjoy that, it can create a lot more freedom for you. It can make the business significantly more valuable in case you ever want to sell it in, in the future. But the, true, the opposite is also true, right? You could end up being miserable because you don't actually enjoy managing people and you don't like systems. And, you know, so there's no right or wrong is really what, what I get at here, Jeff. Um, but whichever, whatever path you choose, it's important that you define what your model is mm -hmm. because depending on your model, um, then you're going to take different steps to build your business, right? So we have clients who, who generate, you know, several million dollars uh, mm -hmm. every year and they, they have teams. Uh, we have others who, you know, are solo independent consultant, you know, doing about a million dollars a year. And then we have, you know, a whole bunch that are lower and higher, like everything in between, there's no right or wrong, but the advice or guidance that we would give to somebody, for example, who is, let's say a solo consultant with maybe with a virtual assistant, um, you know, would be potentially different depending on what their goals are compared to somebody who actually wants to build a team of five or 10 people um, because they're, they're going to have different requirements. They'll need some different inf infrastructure. They'll, right. Their priorities will be different. Yeah. I, I was just thinking when you were talking about that, I can't imagine doing this when I originally started thinking about it, like 2010, right? There was, and I'll, you know, I'll let you know, what, like SaaS-based services, like, oh, I'm going to do my billing through this system. Um, you know, I don't have to go hire a bookkeeper. And then like Fiverr, uh, Upwork, just being able to like, oh, you know what? I don't like my PowerPoint ability to create graphics. I'm going to have this done in 24 hours with an expert. And I mean, because you started doing this before this all started happening. What were people doing beforehand? Were they just hiring and bringing out lots of people or big, making bigger companies? Or I mean, it, it's so again, it's, it's both. Some people were, were just being like, when I started out 20 plus years ago, um, I was very hesitant in, in, you know, in our first company. Uh, or the first, I should say the first consultancy that I was running myself, uh, I was very hesitant to, to bring on other people early on because I thought I can do this myself. I don't want to spend money on other people. It'll take me longer to try and train them. Um, and I was wrong. You know, I, I was very wrong because uh, it's very hard to be successful and to create a great lifestyle and to have, you know, yeah, time and freedom and, and all that kind of stuff. And to really make a, a big impact. Like if, if you want to stay where you are, that's fine. But if you want to continue growing, it's very hard to do that all by yourself. Like you can't do everything by yourself. There's very, very few people that can do that. Um, and that's where learning how to find contractors uh, or freelancers or actually full-time people or part-time, whatever it might be, yeah. uh, is incredibly important. Because if you try and do everything yourself, what's going to end up happening is you spend a lot of time on low value tasks that you shouldn't be doing yourself. And you might think, that it's more beneficial for you to do it yourself. But in fact, if you understand value, uh, you know, you'll quickly realize that when you could hire somebody for, let's say, $50 an hour, which is a, a great rate that you can get really, really, really good people for $50 an hour. And let's say your average value, even if you don't use hourly fees, which you shouldn't, but let's say you do, and your average is, is $250 an hour, that's a, that's a 50, you know, you're essentially losing $200 an hour every time you do that activity yourself, because it's low value, you can get somebody else right. to do it for $50 an hour. So when you see that, it, you start to go, oh, wow, that, that actually means that by bringing somebody on to help me with these things, I'm actually going to be able to go out and create $200 in additional value every hour that yeah. right now where I'm losing $200 uh, every hour. And on that note, um, uh, like, I don't think my customers want me to be doing that work for that hourly rate. Like, like, oh, sorry, this took me an extra three hours and sorry, the bill's a little bigger, but like, I'm terrible with PowerPoint. <laughs> like, exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a very good, it's a very good point. Yeah. I yeah. would agree. Okay. So uh, I'm going to let people know where, where to find you and everything in a, in a minute. But for, for the last couple of months, I've been asking people to try and get into the more human thing what your COVID hobby has been, uh, you know, what's the, you know, what um, have you dug into? I know you're super, you know, you, you, you know, big into all the, the work and everything, but um, has there been a thing like we've got the bread baking? I know somebody who started like fly fishing and things like that. Uh, I bought a boat. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's, that's one. But I mean, I think that the bigger, the, yeah, there haven't really been, I mean, aside from the boat, like I wouldn't say there's big shifts in, uh, in my life. Like it's interesting 
for us because we were already um, you know a distributed virtual company right. with clients and and team members all around the world that when COVID hit, uh, you know we didn't really have an impact. Our our business just got busier. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, it was a nice problem to have. We, we felt and continue to feel very fortunate. Uh, we had to work a lot harder, you know, to support our clients and, and the demand and all that kind of stuff. But uh, th the real big shift for me, I mean, I, I'm in the office right now. I walk from my house, it's 15 minutes or so or, or less. Uh, so again, there's no impact there on, on COVID. The, big, the biggest impact or biggest change for me, Jeff, ha hasn't really been a hobby. I've, I continue to do all the same things that I've done before. The only other thing that's really changed is I used to go to the gym pretty much every day. Uh, and then when COVID started, I stopped going to the gym. I have elderly parents. I didn't really want to take a chance. Uh, and so I just started to run. Uh, and, um, you know, where I am, there's there's all kinds of weather, a lot of rain. And I just decided I'm just going to run every day, uh, every morning, regardless of what the weather's like. And so you, I don't know if I'd call that a hobby. Uh, sometimes it doesn't feel like the most fun when it's early in the morning, but I get it done. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, I spent the last year plus now running through through sun and, and, uh, and wind and rain and snow and everything else. Yeah. Uh, and what's interesting is I don't know if I'll go back to the gym. Like I really do enjoy running. Uh, I find, I mean, I was doing this even at the gym, but when I'm running every day, that's when I'm listening to podcasts. Yeah. So I get to learn, I really get to multitask because it's, it's good for my mind, good for my body. I'm getting inspired. I'm getting motivated. I'm, I'm educating myself. Uh, and so that's something that, uh, I think I, I, if I would call a hobby, it's something that I've taken on. And it's probably the biggest change for me in my life since yeah. COVID started. No, that's great. I, I, thanks for giving me that insight. And yes, that's a great time to, to listen to podcasts as well. <laughs> so, so listen, uh, you've got your website, you've got um, your podcast, which we talked about a little bit. Where's the, because I, I know there are specific people listening to this that they're going to want to dive right in and everything. So where's the best place for them to start and find out a little bit more about how to set themselves up if they're going in that direction? Sure. So home base for everything is consultingsuccess.com. Uh, if you want to go deeper, uh, we've compiled some of our most popular uh, articles in one place. It's a 47 page guide. It's called the consulting blueprint. Uh, you can get that by going to consultingsuccess.com forward slash blueprint. Uh, and I always uh, encourage and welcome people to connect directly. Uh, if you want through LinkedIn, you can find me there, uh, Michael Zapersky. Just put a little note when you send a connection request because I do get a lot of connection requests and uh, <laughs> the ones that don't have any personal note, I tend to not accept because I don't know who the person is. Uh, so just put a little note that you saw or heard on, you know, on uh, just podcast here. I'd be more than happy to, to connect and always happy to provide some guidance and see if there's some resource or um, direction that I can you know, point you in. Absolutely. Well, Michael, thanks for being so open with your time as always. I really do appreciate it. I um, hope you have a great weekend and, and have a couple of great runs uh, going on. Thanks so much. I definitely will, Jeff. One quick second. I'm going to stop the recording and then just uh, get a couple of quick details here. So one second.